I respectfully greet my esteemed professors and colleagues. First, I would like to introduce myself briefly. I am Pnar Özcan, currently working as a research assistant at Istanbul University Faculty of Law, Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law. Although I am not one of the authors of the book, I am proud to be able to assist in the translation of the introduction and presentment chapters and for being on the editorial board of the book. Our program for the presentation of this valuable work, which is called as Humorized Case Law Commentaries on Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, select, Selected Opinions and Corresponding European Court of Human Rights Judgments, will begin with opening speeches. First of all, Professor Adam Sozer, who is the head of Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law Department, one of the editors of the book and pioneered this work, will give an introductory speech about the book. I, mean, I invite our professor to give his speech. Today is, I am very happy because not only uh, my assistant, my guest, my dean here, also my uh, friend, uh, Paolo Pinto here. The another friend uh, is another country, Saadet Yüksel and uh, Pınar Ölçe also here. Uh, this is a uh, very uh, big thing uh, for me. Uh, COVID-19 times bring the, together uh, the people, our uh, university. Dear Judge Yüksel, judge in respect of Turkey at the European Court of Human Rights. Dear Professor Paolo Pinto, the Albuquerque, former judge in respect of Portugal of the European Court of Human Rights. Dear Dean Professor Ömer Ekmekçi, dear authors and reviewers of our book, dear colleagues, dear guests, we have gathered today for a very significant occasion. The significant is due to two reasons. First, for the first time in Turkey, the new generation of Turkish lawyers have analyzed judgment of the European Court of Human Rights and the opinion of Judge Pinto de Albuquerque. Lawyers from academia, the judiciary, and legal practice have come together to bring this book to life. These analyses are not confined to the issues raised in the related judgments and opinions. The authors have also incorporated national case law, such as the judgments of the Turkish Constitutional Court, as well as legal scholarship into their analysis. Second, this book is an indicator of the extent of human rights and legal scholarship in Turkey. In 2005, Turkey embarked on a journey of legal reforms for its European Union membership negotiations. Substantial changes were made in many areas of law, law, such as constitutional, civil, and trade law. Nevertheless, the most important changes were made to criminal court, 
which is called the Turkish criminal law reform. In order to commence membership negotiations, Turkey had to go through with this reform. The criminal law reform is the most extensive in Europe and in the world. The philosophy of the reform is that it puts the individual and rights and freedom of the individual at the center. After this reform, Turkey was no longer a state under the security of the Council of Europe for the first time, as might be accepted, such as such a reform in the realm of human rights came with its challenge. We as lawyers are fully aware of the impact, impact of this reform with regard to human rights. Thanks to this reform, Turkey was no longer considered a state of systematic torture and alternate high standards for the protection of freedom and expression. However, through all the years, certain events undermined these developments. In Turkey, the most pressing issues of human rights are issues of criminal justice. Therefore, the criminal law reform is of utmost importance. Accordingly, the vast majority of this book relates to criminal law and criminal justice, which is a remarkable achievement. Another reason for the significance of this book is the hope it gives us with regard to troubling issues in the administration of the justice in Turkey. We must note that Turkey sometimes takes backward steps with regard to human rights law. One of these steps is the attempt, attempt to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, which is unfortunate. The constitutional norms of gender equality and positive discrimination towards women in Turkey must be realized. Therefore, the first thing to do in this regard is not taking such backward steps. Our editors, authors, and reviewers have gathered to prevent backwards steps and also to take proactive steps in the direction of progress, such as the publication of this book. My friends, I thank you all for your contribution and support to the development of human rights in Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for this great speech, which is encouraging for us. The next speech is going to be made by the Dean of Istanbul University Faculty of Law, Professor Ömer Ekmekci. On behalf of all my colleagues who contributed to the book, I would like to thank our Dean for being here today and giving a speech to us. Dear Professor, 
we are very happy that you are here. It's a great honor for us. Welcome again. Dear participants, dear colleagues, I greet you with all my respect and love. Ben Saadet'e şöyle seslenmeyi seviyorum. Saadet, memlekete hoş geldin, okuluna hoş geldin, şeref verdin. We are gathered today to present the valuable work titled Human Rights with Jurisprudence, Reviews of the Selected Commentaries of Judge Pinto de Albuquerque and Related European Court of Human Rights Decisions. Judge Albuquerque worked as a Portuguese judge at the court between 2011 and 2020. In this work, his commentaries are examined. His commentaries played an important role in the development of all legal fields, especially human rights law. The work we have presented is a proof of this fact. In this work, at about 30 selected commentaries of Judge Albuquerque have been translated into Turkish and analyzed together with the relevant uh, Court of Human Rights decisions. There are many decisions related with uh, labor law. First of all, I would like to congratulate the editors who made this work possible with their dedication and hard work. I want to congratulate former European Court of Human Rights Portuguese judge and currently working at the Catholic University of Lisbon, Faculty of Law, Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure, Professor Dr. Paolo Pinto de Albuquerque. Also, I want to congratulate Adem Abi, Professor Dr. Adem Sözer, who is the head of Istanbul University Faculty of Law, Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law. Also, Associate Professor uh, Pınar Ölçer, who works at Leiden University. And Eren Sözer, Research Assistant Eren Sözer, who works in the Department of General Public Law of our faculty. The commentaries and decisions in the three volume work cover most of the rights included the, in the European Convention of Human Rights and its protocols. Each of the commentaries written by Judge Albuquerque was translated into Turkish and examined in the context of the relevant court decisions and other case law. The authors expressed their own legal opinion and suggestions on legal problems, especially in the context of the Turkish law. This study, which is examples in other countries and languages has been carried out for the first time in such a comprehensive way in and in Turkish law. For this, it's necessary to congratulate the editors and section writers with all my heart. There is no doubt that this work will guide Turkish legal practice and play an important role in understanding European human rights law. Dear Professor, welcome again. Thank you, Professor. Now, uh, one of the editors of our book is not here and uh, cannot be joining uh, from the Zoom, but she has prepared us a speech, Associate Professor Pınar Ölçay. Uh, this speech will be uh, read to us by Research Assistant Yamur Altay. Uh, honorable attendees, uh, dear Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, Judge Yüksel, Dean Ekmekçi, Professor Sözer, and dear authors, it brings me great sadness that Leiden University's pandemic-related travel restrictions mean that I cannot be with you today. I'm grateful uh, to be able to still join you in this manner to wish you all an excellent book launch ceremony. The thought that you are all reuni uh, reunited to mark the publica uh, publication of our labors together makes me extremely happy. Profound thanks are owed to all who worked so hard and contributed in so many different ways. 
Professor Sözer, as always, immediately jumping full force where there's any chance to create an opportunity to bring lawyers together in innovation and legal advancements, generously lending all efforts and means at his disposal to make ideas come to life. Dean Ekmekci, for his support today, his recognition in marking the importance of our project, Judge Yüksel likewise, for her support today, but particularly also throughout her important introduction to our book. To all who worked with painstaking care on the difficult job of, uh, job of organization, editorial work, incredibly complex translation and review work involved therein. To the substantive peer reviewers who offered their valuable time and expertise to ensure the quality of the work. Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, we are all in awe of you as a legal paragon. We are tremendously proud to be uh, part of this collaboration with you and thank you for making this possible, not only as part of our team, but by delivering your charge as a judge at the European Court of Human Rights, as you have done. Your inspirational opinions, unrelenting commitment to human rights law, and devotion to excellence make all lawyers beholden to you. Most of all, the greatest gratitude is due to you, our authors, for your hard work in all of your wonderful chapters. As you know, our Turkish volume now becomes part of a set of similar set of works in diverse other countries, each very special and dear, ours particularly because it's written by you, the young and most, uh, most important generation of lawyers. I feel the greatest uh, pride that our book will permanently decorate so many publication leads and hope that your, your contributions will benefit you always. I'm fully confident that what you have brought together will prove to be a fundamentally important contribution to human rights discourse, a discourse in Turkey. I congratulate you all with deepest respect for this incredible accomplishments. Weather satellites say, say that it will be a pleasant day in Istanbul. I hope a very interesting and fun one, especially in the doctorate hall also. All my best wishes from Leiden, hoping to, you, hoping to see you all again soon, Pnarsh. Now, speeches on behalf of the editors, authors, and reviewers of the book will be given. The duration of these speeches will be limited to three minutes. I kindly request you to pay attention to this. Uh, now, Eran Sözyar, who is a research assistant in the Department of General Public Law, one of the editors of the book and author of the section of Barbulescu versus Romania decision regarding the right to respect for private life and family life, will make her first speech. Esteemed judges, professors, authors and guests, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the editors for giving me the honor to speak on their behalf. Following Professor Ölçaj's most inspiring speech, I would like to present our book's scope, journey, and significance in a very brief manner. The book is a compilation of Judge Pinto de Albuquerque's influential separate opinions, translated into Turkish and analyzed with specific regard to Turkish law. 29 opinions have been annotated by a diverse group of young lawyers with expertise in various areas of law and the legal profession, including academia and the judiciary. As expressed previously during this meeting, the book covers nearly all of the rights enshrined in the Convention, including some rights in the additional protocols, and touches upon a variety of topics. The annotations are not mere reports, but explore the potential impact of the judgments and separate opinions on Turkish law and even beyond. Authors have analyzed both the judgments and the separate opinions in light of various areas of law and have discussed how they should interact with Turkish law. The book does not only aim to harmonize Turkish law with the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence, but also aspires to present avenues of better dialogue between Turkish legal actors and the court. In addition to substantive issues, the annotated opinions address broader issues surrounding the convention system, such as interpretive methods employed by the court, the positioning of the court in domestic law, 
and the relationship between the Council of Europe human rights systems and other human rights protection systems. Now, I would like to briefly take you through the journey of our book, starting from its inception up until today. As explained in detail in the introduction of our book, the roots of this project can be traced back to late 2018, when the book project was conceived by then judge of the European Court of Human Rights, Prof Professor Pinto de Albuquerque, and Professor Sozer and Ochar. Although the idea was inspired by similar projects undertaken in various countries, such as Brazil, Russia, and Ukraine, the separate opinions were chosen purposefully so as to have particular relevance in the Turkish context. The editors worked meticulously through the 160 opinions authored by Judge Pinto de Albuquerque. Once a pool of opinions was formed, Professors Sozer and Ölçer invited young Turkish lawyers interested in human rights law to contribute as authors. The criterion of authors being young lawyers was of specific importance to the editors as this, as this book is the first, but hopefully not the least of its kind in Turkey and last of its kind in Turkey, as the book is intended to set in motion similar publications by way of example. A while after authors started working on their chapters under direction of the editors, a meeting was organized in August 2019 at the same venue as today. For some reason, I'm unable to uh, share my screen, but um, there were some photos uh, of today um, in which uh, Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, uh, Professor Adam Sozar and Professor Pinaroche came together with most of our authors in which our authors presented their preliminary findings regarding the opinions and the judgment to Professor Pinto de Albuquerque and received feedback on their upcoming work. And this was a particularly uh, fruitful meeting in the form of a workshop, which lasted all day and was, to be honest, exhausting, but very rewarding. And this, the uh, conclusions of this meeting actually helped authors uh, immensely to conclude their project. And um, uh, after long and tiresome work on, on the uh, chapters, the chapters were concluded by the authors. But um, just to talk briefly about this pro uh, process, this, uh, the authors were not left alone and worked under the direction of the editors who provided the format and also the motivation of, uh, of the writing of these chapters. I would also like to briefly point out um, a specific importance uh, of, the, of one of the aspects in this process. As some of you might know, uh, there is a lot of dissent with regard to uh, the terminology of European uh, uh, Court of Human Rights Law case law in Turkey, and um, academics uh, have started recently writing about this and are uh, trying to initiate a common terminology. I believe uh, one of the successes of our project was in the sense as uh, editors and authors came together and uh, worked collaboratively to create a common terminology and also to translate the European Court of Human Rights case law in the most accurate way to, to Turkish. So this is one of the um, uh, particular ways of our project. Uh, and um, finally, not to repeat what has already been expressed, I would like to very briefly talk about the particular significance of our work. And the originality of this project uh, in, in the Turkish context is that uh, it is the first of its kind. So um, hopefully, uh, e even if it's by of examples, other publications will be made, be it in the journal or in the book uh, format, similar to this work. And also, a significance of this book is that it relates to many areas of law, although they are under the flag of human rights law. So this publication was an opportunity to observe the interrelated nature of all disciplines of law. For instance, um, the piece that I worked on was on labor law, of which I didn't have any, any knowledge or expertise in, but it was a, a wonderful opportunity for me to observe how these areas of law were so interconnected and interrelated. And actually the distinction between these law, uh, areas of law are quite artificial and they mu must not be separated. Also, um, another significance is that uh, the opinions as well as the judgment do not only address the problems of today, but also address the problems of the future and how Judge Pinto de Albuquerque's opinions can light can shed an, a very uh, strong light in this sense. Uh, again, referring to my own piece, the Barbulescu judgment, um, when I was writing this judgment, I observed the change in the jurisprudence of the Turkish constitutional Lord, uh, court, which was 
um, in, the, in the first sense, it followed the chamber judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, which Judge Pinto de Albuquerque wrote a dissenting opinion to. But then uh, the Grand Chamber reversed this judgment, which was quite in accordance with Judge Pinto de Albuquerque's opinion. And then the Turkish Constitutional Court followed uh, the European Court of Human Rights' final judgment, of the Grand Chamber judgment. So I could not help but think if the Turkish Constitutional Court had paid a little closer attention to Judge Pinto de Albuquerque's opinion, then this change in jurisprudence could have happened sooner and could have helped a lot of more laborers. So um, uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my speech. And uh, while doing that, I would like to express that it has truly been an honor to be an editor and author of this book. And I would like to sincerely thank the authors, the editors, the reviewers, and our Dean Amerik Mekci for supporting us today. Thank you. Now, Kemal Kumkumoğlu who is a lawyer registered at Istanbul Bar Association and the author of the section on Volodina versus Russia decision regarding the provision of torture will give his speech. Here are our special guests, Professor Pinto, dear Dean, uh, the professors, dear judges and prosecutors, and dear colleagues. It's a great honor to be gathered here with you once again, almost two years ago. Uh, most of us have been here for a long day discussing our cases at hand with former Judge Pinto. And I remember that all of us were truly impressed by how he was passionate and dedicated about all these cases that concern complex judicial issues on a wide spectrum. It was clearly an inspirational day for all of us. Happily, throughout the rest of the journey, I witnessed the same passion and dedication from my colleagues who put their best there to put their best of their knowledge and effort on the table for this amazing work. I'm definitely feeling lucky to be here among, this, among yourselves and be a part of this special group. So hereby, I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity. I'll take this opportunity to thank all of you, also Professor Sözer, Professor Ölçer, and Professor Pinto to bring us all together and lead the way. As a member of Istanbul Bar Association, one of the largest bar associations of the world, I know that our mission is beyond practicing the law and dealing with our daily cases. We are responsible for our society that we are living in, and it, it goes beyond of our offices, our courthouses, and even our borders. Thus, we need to work uh, with other members of legal community, academia, judges, prosecutors, and members of NGOs to have the rule of law and human rights respected everywhere, locally and globally. For this reason, I see this cooperation and this work that we accomplished today as a clear example that we need to establish going forward. The world we are living in now is connected. It's connected physically, digitally, and legally more than ever. We, as a member of legal community, we need to work together to find this delicate balance of rights and freedoms in this new digital world, hold public and private sector actors in check, and also we need to work with other disciples to understand the technical aspects of our legal problems. I know that most of my colleagues here belong to Generation Y, and I know that we have been under the shadow of Generation Z lately. However, before their time will come, as a generation that was born in post-Cold War era, was raised and educated under the influence of freedom and security dichotomies of 9-11, and has seen populist and pragmatist policies of national governments of 21st century, and has witnessed the first steps of global digital transformation, we have the responsibility of finding and creating the first legal milestones for the bridge between the manual and digital world. It's not coincidence that the case that I worked on, Volodina versus Russia, regarding domestic violence, has been followed by Volodina 2 versus Russia, which is about digital violence. Our task is not easy. We must have solid legal background, and at the same time, we need to cooperate and understand what's coming next faster than ever. However, as an incurable optimist, I'm hopeful. And one of the great reasons of that is sharing moments like this 
with incredible and inspirational leaders and pioneers like you. Thank you. Now, Nesya Anjan, who is a research assistant at the Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law and the author of the section on Lopez de Souza Fernandez versus Portuguese decision regarding the right to live, will give her speech. Dear honorable academics and fellow participants, uh, first of all, I would like to thank for you all coming and let me introduce myself. I am a PhD student in Istanbul University, Department of Public Law but also I am research assistant in Recep Tayyip Erdogan University. Nearly more than two and a half years ago, we have started to plan this project. And now it's such an honor to be at the launch of our long-term efforts as a hard copy version of a book. When I was asked to have a speech here today, um, I remembered all about this project, how we were all passionate and how we were all mesmerized by the idea of uh, writing on the dissenting or concurring opinions about uh, for Judge Pinto. And now we are uh, here and uh, we had many presentations about two years ago, just right here in front of you, your honor, Judge Pinto. So what did I benefit from this project? Frankly speaking, it's hard to count all, but uh, I, at least I can say a few of them. First, so to say, the scope of our research areas widened. To illustrate this, most of our, the participants, including me, our main research area was criminal law. So, uh, coming to the field of human rights law, we are just familiar with the right to liberty or right to fair trial, and rather than the rights uh, prescript under the European Convention on Human Rights. But in the context of this project, we have whole convention in front of us, regardless of the articles mentioned in convention. For instance, I analyzed a case related to right to healthcare and related to right to life, Lopez de Souza Fernandez versus Portugal. Apart from the scope of setting areas widened, uh, the comparative approach was another uh, approach that I get pr from this project. Because we have three dimensions in front of us. First, the judgment of European Court of Human Rights, then the uh, reproductive and the pioneering opinions from Judge Pinto de Albuquerque. And also finally, we have cases from Turkish Constitutional Court. During this study, personally, this is the most challenging and demanding I found myself about this comparison part. But, but we compiled all these ideas on and all these dimensions. And I did believe we managed to present a holistic approach and holistic uh, perspective to the readers of the book. Therefore, I hope this project to keep on with the other authors and uh, other landmark cases and uh, concurring or dissenting opinions from Judge Pinto de Albuquerque. I, I guess this is all from me today and thank you for your attention. Now, Sahat Mahmutolo, who is a public prosecutor and author of the section on Mercy versus Croatia decision regarding the provision of torture, will give his speech. Dear Honorable Judge, dear Mr. Dean, say Nadim uh, dear participants, uh, dear friends. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here like such an event uh, after two years. And I also so glad to see Judge Pinto here after two years in Istanbul again in the same hall. Uh, between 2011 and 29, 2020, during his nine-year period, Judge Pinto made a special effort to raise the standards of fund fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, I uh, never seen that there's no example, a judge like you for European court history. As we all know, your dissenting opinions, your uh, contributions are most, most of the time, they are longer than the main decision. So it's very important. Uh, for this purpose, you have written large of dissenting opinions and I think each is, uh, has scientific value. The result of this, we have this book here. Judge Pinto, he not only inspired human rights lawyers, but also he made very important warnings uh, and criticism to European Court of Human Rights and also the Council of Europe. In his opinions, he criticized 
the politics of the European Council, European Court of Human Rights, judges. Uh, and I believe that in years, during uh, very few years, your dissenting opinions will take place to court's decision, court's today's decisions, I uh, believe. For example, in Morsic's decision, which is my part in the section three in the book, uh, regarding the conditions of the detention under the article three of the convention, you harshly criticize, you very strongly criticize to European court. For us, the lawyers, for academicians, it's very easy to criticize the court. But a judge, a member judge of the court, for nine years, it's not easy to criticize to the court. You under pressure of the court, you under pressure of your country. So I really congratulate you for nine years of determination and your courage. Uh, when I finish my words, it's very important that this valuable efforts take a response in Turkey. And I hope, I believe the other countries will take an example of our project. And I believe that this work will make very important contribution to the Turkish human rights law. On this occasion, I would like to thank to Mr. Dean, uh, Professor Adam Sözer, Eren Sözer, uh, Istanbul University Law School, and all my friends, authors, colleagues for this important work. Thank you very much. Now, Assistant Professor Volkan Aslan, who is working in the Department of Constitutional Law, and one of our professors who reviewed the sections of the book will give his speech. We would like to thank him for his efforts in the process of the publication of the book and for taking his time to make his speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And sorry, when I, whenever I get to this place, I always get excited because I had defended my PhD thesis here. And uh, whenever I come to this place again, I feel as if I'm still defending my thesis. And <laughs> it's also difficult to accustom to the situation after the pandemic conditions. You know, we got used to making this kind of conferences from the Zoom or other online uh, based uh, platforms. So I'm still excited, although I've been working for the faculty more than 10 years, both as an academician, both, uh, both as a research assistant and uh, assistant professor. First of all, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation for this beautiful project uh, to my dear uh, Professor Adam Sözer for uh, Ömer Ekmekçi. And of course, I would like to welcome Judge uh, Pinto to Turkey. Actually, it's always uh, welcoming and honor for me to uh, meet uh, people with Strasbourg because since I started my academic career, I always uh, find a connection with Strasbourg. I was writing my master thesis about the friendly settlements before the European Court of Human Rights. And when Judge Pinto was uh, in the court in 2013, I was working at the library of the court and I was assisting Nora Binder, the old librarian of the uh, court. And I had a wonderful three months at the court while I was writing my thesis. And then um, two years ago, I was uh, visiting the Fondation René Cassin for Summer School on Human Rights. So our ways with Strasbourg intersected again. And currently, uh, Judge uh, Yuxel is working at Strasbourg Court and I was teaching assistant of her. Uh, so I always find connection with Strasbourg, which makes me actually really uh, delighted. And uh, for these connections, I would also uh, thank to Strasbourg and I would like to uh, welcome Professor uh, Judge Pinto, and I accept him still from the Strasbourg guest, so thank you. Um, my name is Volkan Aslan. I'm working as an assistant professor at Constitutional Law Department at uh, Istanbul Law School. Uh, today, uh, we are celebrating the publication of the commentaries on Judge Pinto de Albuquerque, select opinions and uh, corresponding court judgments in uh, Turkish. Uh, as I know, more than 150 uh, opinions annexed by Judge Pinto to the judgments of the uh, court. And actually, as Eran said, it's the first time in Turkish legal doctrine that separate opinions of a judge were translated into Turkish and commentaries regarding these translations were uh, written. And uh, in this uh, regard, I would like to cite a concurring opinion of Judge Pinto from the case Ahmet Yildirim versus Turkey, 
which was decided in 2012, and it was about uh, blocking of a website as an example. When I look at the concurring opinion of the Judge Pinto, after citing 11 minimum criteria for the convention compatible legislation on internet blocking measures, Judge Pinto evaluated Turkey and determined that our law regarding internet lays down only uh, following criteria for the issuance of an internet blocking order, which is, as he said, the nature of the criminal offenses or activities which may give rise to a blocking order, the degree of evidence necessary for a blocking order to be issued, the competence of the judge, the court, or in urgent matters, the public prosecutor to issue the blocking order, an appeal against the order and its termination when the accused is acquitted, the case is dismissed, or the illegal content is deleted. Thus, the national legislation, although not arbitrary, since it entrusts the judiciary the power to block or not to block, is at least very deficient because it doesn't surround the exercise of judicial power with all the required conditions and safeguards and therefore does not afford basic guarantees of freedom of expression to internet content providers. In view of the insufficient guarantees provided by Turkish law with regard to the blocking of internet publications, he would also have found it established based on the article 46 that the respondent states, which is Turkey, has a duty to amend the legislation in line with the standards uh, set out above. Actually, until this decision, it was not possible to find that kind of legal argumentation uh, in the judgments of Turkish courts or even in legal uh, doctrine in Turkey. But the Judge Pinto's evaluation also helped us to improve our legislation and set light to the way we should follow, actually. And currently, we are much more developed. Of course, we have still <laughs> lots of problems. But thanks to his uh, evaluation, we are now far away from the uh, first place we were in. Separate opinions are also important because they can be the mainstream opinions of the course in the future. They are also important for the legal doctrine, for making legal evaluations, of course. But, of course, we, we should make a distinction between the concurring opinions and dissenting opinions. If dissenting opinions gain more attention and value it more, it means that there are serious problems regarding the judgments of the court we are talking about. Unfortunately, this started to be valid for the Turkish Constitutional Court recently, because we started to attach more importance to some of the dissenting opinions explained in the judgments, actually which aim a better protection for the basic rights in Turkey. But ironically, these opinions are also important because they can be the mainstream opinion of our courts uh, in the future. And by this way, there might be a better protection of basic rights in Turkey as well. And in order to achieve this target, the duty also falls upon us. We have to write and publish more about, about the separate opinions. And in this regard, publishing Judge Pinto's separate opinions is a perfect start for Turkish legal doctrine. Before I end my speech, I would like to thank again uh, Judge Pinto, Professor Sözer, and Professor Emer Ekmekci, and the project owners for this amazing uh, work. Please do accept my best regards. Thank you. We would like to thank uh, for all these great speeches. Now, Professor Paolo Pinto de Albuquerque, who guided the legal community with his comments he wrote on the European Court of Human Rights decisions, Portuguese judge of the European Court, uh, Court of Human Rights, uh, 2011 2020, professor in the Department of Criminal and Criminal Procedure at the Catholic University of Lisbon, Faculty of Law, and one of the editors of the book, will give a speech on judicial independence. After this 30 minute speech, there will be a 15 minute question and answer session, and Professor Adam Sosia will moderate it. Dear Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Istanbul, Professor Dr. Omer Ekmekci, dear Professor Dr. Judge Sadat Yuxel, who already left us, uh, dear Professor Dr. Adam Suzur, dear Professor Dr. Pinar Osher, who could not be with us, and dear Dr. Eren Suzur, Dear friends, 
dear colleagues, it is an immense honor and a great pleasure to be hosted today by you in this magnificent building to launch this three volume book about the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. I'm deeply thankful to you and to all Turkish colleagues and friends with whom I share the passion for human rights. And in particular, to those that I have already mentioned. Professor Dr. Judge Sadet Yuxel, Professor Dr. Adam Suzur, Professor Dr. Pinar Olsher, and Dr. Eren Suzur, who are the main responsible for the dissemination of my legal opinions in the Turkish academic world. This has been a long journey together, a long but amazing journey. The idea of this book was born four years ago. When I met Professor Dr. Pinar Olser in a conference organized by Leiden University. I remember Professor Pinar Olser's enthusiasm, immediate enthusiasm with this idea. She was a real fan of human rights and she still is a real fan of human rights. And she realized the possible impact of this book, of this project in the reform of the law and the practice in Turkey. Since then, we have been working together to make the case law of the European Court of Human Rights more accessible to the Turkish public in general and to the Turkish academics in particular. Under the guidance of Professor Adam Suzur and with the remarkable cooperation with the formidable cooperation of Dr. Eren Suzur and all of you, we could organize this excellent book with some of my separate opinions translated into Turkish, which uh, was kindly prefaced by Professor Dr. Judge Sadet Yuxel. This edition is unique in Turkish legal history since it is fully dedicated to human rights law and to the Strasbourg case law that is of the utmost importance to the Turkish people. Moreover, like other editions that were launched uh, in some other European countries, like France, like Spain, like Italy, Russia, Ukraine, this book includes commentaries. This is an extremely important added value. Commentaries, groundbreaking commentaries by you, young lawyers and academics who have linked the Strasbourg case law and my opinions with the Turkish reality, with the Turkish legal framework and especially with the case law of the Constitutional Court and the Turkish scholarship. I'm also thankful to Professor Dr. Adam Suzur, who has invited me to Istanbul three years ago. This visit was amazing. It allowed me to appreciate the high quality of your work, of this incredible group of talented young lawyers and academics. And it also allowed me to deepen my emotional relationship with this university. 
During that visit, I had an opportunity to discuss with you face to face the most pressing legal issues. Finally, I would like to thank and commend all Turkish judges, prosecutors, lawyers, and academics whom I had the pleasure to meet in Strasbourg during my mandate. It was always with great satisfaction that I engaged with all of these colleagues in a fruitful and exciting legal debate. Dear Dean, I am an admirer of the Turkish culture. I am a firm believer that Turkey belongs to Europe. I am a strong believer that um, Turkey should be fully integrated in Europe in every sense, including economics and politics, everything. What I have done in the past, making this project possible with the extraordinary contribution of these young lawyers and academics, I will do also in the future. This is my promise before you. You can count on me. You can count on me. This university can count always on me for the promotion of the cause of human rights in Turkey. And to, of course, reinforce the position of this university in the Turkish society. As a token of my friendship, I already had the pleasure of offering the library of this university to three books in different languages. Um, and I also prepared a short um, reflection on a topic that is of the utmost importance nowadays about uh, the independence of uh, the judiciary. I will take a little bit of your time to reflect with you on this topic, of course, being afterwards available uh, to respond to your queries. It is quite common in Europe to find councils of the judiciary with important powers, in particularly concerning the appointment and dismissal of judges. Due to the sensitive nature of these functions, the composition and the mode of appointment of the members of the Council of the Judiciary, it's extremely important. In view of the assessing of their independence, and there have been quite a few cases in Strasbourg where this issue has been discussed. A clear cut case in that respect is Volkov versus Ukraine, adjudicated by the fifth section of the European Court. The same standards for evaluating the independence of these bodies were later reiterated in the Grand Chamber of the same court in the case Denisov versus Ukraine. In the first of these cases, the applicant, a Supreme Court judge, has been dismissed from the post of judge by a recommendation of the High Council of Justice, later confirmed by Parliament. In the second case, the applicant had been dismissed from the position of president of a court of appeal, also following a recommendation of Ukraine's High Council of Justice in a disciplinary procedure. While evaluating if the Ukraine's High Council could be considered as an independent an impartial tribunal under Article 6 of the Convention, the European Court found very serious structural deficiencies in the composition, modes of appointment, and administrative and financial uh, workings of that institution. Where the deficiencies concerned the composition of the High Council, the European Court underlined this, the small minority of judges represented in the High Council, in contrast with half of the High Council being composed of members directly originating from the political or prosecution authorities. In particular, 
of a total of 20 members in addition to the Minister of Justice and the Prosecutor General being ex officio members of this body, six members were chosen by parliament and by the president of the Republic, three each. And two were chosen by the conference of pros prosecutors. Only three members were chosen by judges, in addition to the president of the Supreme Court. But as appointed, as pointed out in uh, Alexander Volkov, even if half of the members of the I Council were to be judges, that fact alone would not be enough to guarantee the independence and impartiality of that body. On this point, the European Court stressed the importance of judges being appointed by their peers and not by external powers. The European Court further noted that uh, the weighty presence of elements originating from prosecution authorities was a manifest shortcoming of the I Council in view of the functional role of prosecutors in domestic judicial proceedings. Finally, the European Court pointed out that the members of the disciplinary body play the role in the preliminary inquiry in a disciplinary case and subsequently participated in the determination of the same case, concluding that such a duplication of functions could also cast doubt on the impartiality of those members. In an extremely important subsequent case, a Portuguese case, a Grand Chamber case against Portugal, Ramos Nunes versus Portugal, the European Court of Human Rights further analyzed the institutional architecture of the I Judicial Council, namely the Portuguese I Council of Judges. And although maintaining in the essence the above referred case law, they added some new points. Unfortunately, though they also failed an opportunity, a golden opportunity uh, to resolve some points that were left open. Um, the decision failed to an analyze the role of the president of the Supreme Court while being at the same time president of the I Council of Judges. To put it into context and to be brief, the decisions of the I Council were subject to an appeal to the judicial division of the Supreme Court. The president of the Supreme Court thereby participated in the decision of the I Council and their appeal. And although not participating in the referred judicial decision could determine to a certain extent the composition of that division. Who would be a member of that composition? Due to the shortcomings of this institutional architecture, the appearance of impartiality could not be said to have been obtained and the composition of the tribunal uh, did not pass the test of objective impartiality. That was at least the opinion of several uh, dissenting judges. Indeed, um, there was more to that more elements that complicated this analysis. The judges stress the importance of complete institutional independence of the body, whose powers including, included uh, to launch a disciplinary procedure against a judge. There should be total institutional integrity and autonomy of a body which has the competence to launch a disciplinary procedure against a judge. All these points, uh, at this point, uh, it will be interesting to turn our attention to the European Union case law, starting with the Grand Chamber's judgment in the preliminary ruling procedure under Article 267, AK and others. The question to be answered there by the, uh, the Court of Justice by referral of the, Poly, uh, of the Polish um, Supreme Court uh, was primarily related to a creation of a new disciplinary chamber in the Supreme Court of Poland within the same Supreme Court. This new disciplinary chamber had been provided with a somewhat extensive, very extensive jurisdiction, including not only 
exclusive jurisdiction to adjudicate disciplinary procedures concerning Supreme Court judges, but also for proceedings in the field of labor law, for instance, and social security of judges. And those regarding very controversial issue of compulsory retirement of those judges. Not surprisingly, at the center of the main proceedings were cases related to the compulsory retirement of three Supreme Court judges in Poland. The issues relating to the independence of this chamber, special chamber of the Supreme Court of Poland were connected to the question of the independence of the Polish High Council for Justice. This connection with uh, and this interaction between the two bodies, the Supreme Court and the High Council for Justice was raised in the judgment uh, and could not be avoided since the judgments of the, the new disciplinary chamber were all without exception to be, um, the judges of the new disciplinary chamber were all without exception to be appointed by the president of the Republic by proposal of the Polish High Council for Justice. It should be noted that the Court of Justice, due to the very nature of the preliminary ruling procedure, did not have the power to declare uh, that um, uh, the High Council for Justice was not independent. They could not do this. And that this lack of independence necessarily affected the independence of the new chamber. For that power belonged to the national courts, not to the Court of Justice of the European Union. But Within its legitimate power, however, the Court of Justice did not miss the chance to give the necessary instruments, the necessary guidance to allow the referring court to form a correct understanding on this issue. Indeed, on the point relating to the concept of an independent and impartial tribunal foreseen in the second paragraph of Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the Court of Justice underlined that the interpretation of such concept should safeguard a level of protection that does not fall below the level of protection established in Article 6 of the European Convention, as interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights. This is extremely important because the Court of Justice was incorporating in its own case law the standards of the Strasbourg Court. In its understanding of the independence and impartiality requirements, the Court of Justice therefore aligned itself with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, stressing the importance of inter alia, the mode of appointment, uh, appointment of the members of a given body, the existence of institutional guarantees against outside pressure, and of course, the issue about the appearance, the appearance which is extremely important in a democratic society, the appearance of independence. In this context and regarding the role of the Polish Council in the appointment process, the Court of Justice could not but underline certain alleged facts that clearly indicated risks of outside pressure from both the legislature and the executive. In the first place, um, the council was formed by reducing the ongoing four year term in office of the former members of that body. In other words, the council had been expunged of its former members. Secondly, whereas previous, previously, the 15 members of the council ele elected among members of the judiciary were elected by their peers, which is okay, they were now elected by a branch of the legislature. In some members directly originating from or elected by the political authorities, now amounted, amounted to 23 out of a total of 25. 23 political appointed members out of a total of 25. The Court of Justice also stressed the potential for irregularities which could have adversely affected the process of appointment of certain members of a new, no, newly formed council, namely the lack of transparency and possible illegality of the election. In this regard, according to the Court of Justice, particular attention 
should also be taken to the actual conduct of the newly formed council, especially its lack of adoption of any stance for the purposes of defending the independence of the judiciary. No guidelines, no recommendation, nothing. In spite of a very controversial ongoing legislative reforms. On the other hand, according to what was stated by the referring court, uh, the council had publicly criticized members of the Supreme Court, including for having referred questions to the Court of Justice for a preliminary ruling. So the council was criticizing the judges for exercising their absolutely lawful power of referring a question to the Court of Justice of the European Union. A little more than a year after this ruling in A and B and others, uh, another preliminary ruling procedure, the Court of Justice was confronted with similar issues concerning, again, the Council uh, in Poland. This case related not to disciplinary issues, but to appeals lodged before the referring court, the Polish Supreme Administrative Court this time. By candidate, candidates for judicial positions within the civil and criminal chambers of the Supreme Court. These candidates were challenging resolutions by which the council did not accept their applications and instead submitted to the president of the, of the Republic other candidates for appointment to those same positions. As noted in this case, the act by which the council put forward a candidate for appointment to a position of judge at uh, at the Supreme Court was an essential condition for such a candidate to be appointed. The situation was even more critical due to the fact that neither the decisions of the council nor those of the president of the Republic were subject to any effective judicial control. In effect, regarding the appeal regime applicable to resolutions of the council in Poland, uh, it was constructed in such a way to be a mere travesty of rights. This is the conclusion of the Court of Justice. Indeed, any individual appeal did not prevent another candidate to be appointed for the same vacancy. So while the appeal was lodged, the other candidate would be appointed if all the other candidates had not also appealed, including the successfully proposed candidate. Of course, this would be impossible because the one taking the seat would not attack the decision. In other words, candidates would have to appeal against their own interests for the appeal to have any real effect. This, of course, was a clear travesty of an appeal system. These issues were all the more important because the recent legal reforms in Poland included a law that reduced the retirement age of judges of the Polish Supreme Court from 70 years to 65 years, while making the possibility of continuing to hold office beyond that age subject to authorization by the President of the Republic. Put in simple terms, by compulsory retirement of the judges of the Supreme Court, and at the same time by giving powers to the Council, such powers, um, which was now under the influence of the legislature, as we have seen, to propose new judges for the positions in the Supreme Court, as well as judges to sit in the disciplinary chamber, as we have seen, the government was turning the highest ordinary court in Poland, at least in appearance and in fact, um, as notorious notoriously subject to outside influence. The Supreme Court would therefore lose any hope of being an independent and impartial tribunal within the meaning of EU, EU law and the European Convention. Let me now uh, come to um, more recent case law. And I would like to, to uh, point out the case where I was a member of the composition. Of course, I'm not going to reveal any any secrets of the deliberation, um, I'm, I'm bound by, by secrecy, but uh, you can read uh, the, the, um, the separate opinion that I have written in the Icelandic case, the Grand Chamber case, Astradson versus uh, Iceland. This is an extremely interesting case, Grand Chamber case. 
In this recent case, the applicant who had been convicted of a low level criminal offense claimed that the appointment of one of the judges to the new court of appeal uh, that had intervened at appeal level had breached the law of the country. And as a consequence, the applicant's right to a tribunal established by law had not been safeguarded. This led the court to scrutinize the appointment of the aforementioned judge to the newly created court of appeal. Why am I choosing a case from Iceland? Because I think, and this is important to stress, that the problem of judicial independence is not a problem of Eastern Europe, it's not a problem of Southern Europe, it's not a problem of Western Europe, it's a problem that in fact should worry all of Europe. So I chose a case from Eastern Europe, but I also chose a case from Western Europe. I chose to describe the problems with the uh, system in Poland, but I also wanted to draw your attention to the problems related uh, to the system in Iceland and including in my own country, in Portugal. Um, according to the, uh, to the procedure of the appointments uh, to that court, to that Icelandic court, the decision of the Minister of Justice was to be preceded by a list of the most qualified candidates authored by an independent administrative body, the Evaluation Committee. Any divergence of the minister from that list would have to be duly justified before the respective parliament and needed its approval. The Minister of Justice was therefore entitled to propose her own candidates to parliament based on an independent investigation of all the elements necessary to substantiate or, or is the divergence in accordance with the uh, well-established rules of administrative law. Um, in, the court, uh, in the court's assessment of the case, it took uh, for granted the conclusions that of the uh, Icelandic Supreme Court. So the court accepted the conclusions of the Icelandic Supreme Court with regard to the existence of a breach of national law concerning the appointment procedure of the four judges, including the judge in the main proceedings involving the applicant. The breach of law in question consisted foremost in the failure of the minister to carry out an independent evaluation of the facts or to provide adequate reasons for her decision to choose four judges that add not being advanced by the evaluation committee. Surely she had invoked reasons such as superior judicial experience of our preferred judge and gender balance, but these were visibly ungrounded reasons for it was most apparent that these reasons had not been applied to all the chosen judges. Yet they had permitted her to cherry pick the appointed four in detriment of other four persons. All this with the most uncomfortable background, it should be noted, uh, that the directly envisaged judge was the wife of a parliamentarian belonging to the same party as the minister. You see the connection. Who had given up the first place in the party's constituency list in Reykjavik in favor of that minister immediately before the beginning of the judge selection process. So very, very uh, backstage uh, maneuvering. After rec recognizing the described breach of law, the court quickly moved on to evaluate the consequences of the breach regarding the, the right to a tribunal established by law. In this context, the court made use of a new threshold test to determine whether the breach in question was of such gravity as to entail a violation of the right to a tribunal. This test basically consists of three steps. First, a positive one that consists in the recognition of a manifest breach of domestic law. So domestic law is always fundamental. Second, a teleological step consisting in a, an evaluation of whether that breach 
translated into a real risk uh, that the other governmental bodies, namely the government administration, in particular uh, the executive branch, could exercise undue pressure uh, in relation to the domestic court. Third, a step concerning the effective review conducted by the national courts, if any, and whether these effective re remedies were so provided. After verifying these three conditions, the European court concluding that there had been a violation of the right to a tribunal established by law by Iceland. But, but came short of determining the proper legal consequences. It determined that there had been a violation, but it did not determine the consequences of such a violation under Article 46. And that's why I wrote separately, because I think if you find a violation of such a gravity, the procedure where such a violation existed cannot stand. Indeed, instead of sustaining the reopening of the applicant's case, and all similar cases due to the simple absence of a tribunal established by law adjudicating those cases, the courts concluded that the mere finding of a violation should be regarded as just satisfaction. I wrote separately saying the consequences should be very serious. The violation is serious, so the consequences should also be serious. What I wrote was that no consequences, no real consequences uh, were drawn from the judgment. So the judgment, in my view, was a paper tiger, a tiger made out of paper. One must admit that this kind of non-result begs the question on how decisions of a non-tribunal, as the Icelandic tribunal, a non-tribunal, which was not composed properly, may subsist in the legal order. How can decisions of a non-tribunal, the court, the European court considered this not to be a real tribunal, how can their decisions subsist? We should also ask if the result would be the same if instead of a low level criminal case, a high level one was at hand. Would that sentence subsist? Imagine. 20 years in jail, would that penalty subsist in spite of the violation? In this case, it was not serious. It was uh, a low level offense, but would it subsist uh, such, a, such a, a, a serious penalty? At any rate, if decisions of a non-tribunal are to subsist in a legal order, who is expected to take that legal order seriously? No one would take seriously a legal order, the Icelandic legal order or any other, where a judgment delivered by a non-tribunal, a tribunal which is composed, which is not properly composed, delivers a judgment, especially in criminal procedure. As we have leave these questions suspended in the thin air, I come now to some conclusions. We leave all of us in Europe all of us in Europe, in a turning point, at a turning point of history, where the independence of the judiciary is being, in some European countries, under attack. It's not only in Eastern Europe, it's not only in Southern Europe, it's not only in Western Europe, it's all over. Let's not be naive, it's all over. In particularly, I referred to the examples of Poland, Iceland, and my own country, Portugal. That does not mean that insufficiencies in the independence of the judiciary do not exist in other countries. Of course they exist. But it seems that in those countries, at least apparently, uh, the problem is solved at the national level. The case law analyzed in this paper shows that the attacks on independence of judges occur through the composition of bodies, especially the composition of the Supreme Court and the composition of disciplinary committees or divisions inside the Supreme Court, and of course, the composition of the Judicial Council. This composition 
And in particular, the presence of majorities that do not originate from the judiciary, they originate from the political branch of the state and are eventually subject to political selection, indicate that those bodies serve as backdoors for the executive eventually to exert some type of pressure, allowing these powers to influence impor important decisions on the judiciary, like appointments, dismissals, or even punitive power, such as punishing a judge in a disciplinary procedure. And this evidently puts at stake, puts at risk the independence and impartiality of the judges. Furthermore, changes in the disciplinary regimes the determination of specific powers to uh, initiate criminal proceedings against judges and the opening up of the personal liability of judges for his or own decision, together with the weakening of defense rights, all of this is very, very problematic. And is unfortunately becoming a trend all over Europe. I have mentioned a couple of cases, you know for sure many other. Um, in the specific domain of the appointment of judges to strategic judiciary positions, in particular, uh, in the example of Poland, the Polish Supreme Court and Constitutional Court, the cases have shown that the executive will engage in unlawful, unconstitutional measures for the control of the judiciary, naming, namely by picking certain candidates over others and make it impossible to obtain judicial review of such choices. Where the referred Constitutional Court is concerned in Poland, the executive and the legislature went to extend uh, to the extent of declaring former valid appointments by par parliament, you know, you have heard that on the news, invalid against the findings of the same constitutional court. As an effect of such reforms, the present composition of the Polish constitutional court has substantially changed to incorporate at least three judges in a total of 15, which have, according to the European Union, invalidly been appointed by the current legislature. The European Court uh, of Human Rights and European uh, Court of Justice are vital legal instruments to protect the independence of the judiciary. Strasbourg and Luxembourg are there to protect judges, are there to protect the independence of judges against legal manipulations, including ones enacted at the highest level, at the level of the legislature, the domestic legislature. Both the Court of Justice and the European Court uh, uh, of Human Rights are ultimately responsible for upholding those legal instruments and have frequently been confronted with hard cases, very, very sensitive cases. The Court of Justice has aligned itself with the case law of the European Court, where standards of independence, very high standards of independence of the judiciary are upheld. Furthermore, the Court of Justice has been unequivocal in stating the primacy of the European Union law as a fundamental principle directly related to the independence of the judiciary. And we know that uh, the Polish Constitutional Court is now deciding on this, on this problem of the uh, prevalence of European Union law over domestic law. The European Court sometimes seems hesitant. The European Court the Strasbourg court sometimes seems hesitant on drawing the consequences. I refer to the Icelandic case. Um, frequently, sometimes falling short of stating its powers and determining the actual consequences uh, that should take place in the legal orders concerned. The European Court of Human Rights seems therefore more dependent uh, sometimes on the context of the case than on being bound by principles. Let's hope that both courts stick to this essential principle of the independence of judiciary. It is crucial for the sake 
of safeguarding democracy and the separation of powers in Europe. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we have uh, some time, uh, some comments or uh, questions. El mikrofonu var. Söz almak e, isteyen arkadaşlar, herkes tabii ki e, yorum, katkı, düşünce, proje ile ilgili veya konuşma ile ilgili soru e, Pinto'ya yönelik olarak. Etül doğru görüyorum değil mi bu sefer? Maske olunca insanları karışın. Şimdi e, projemize e, çeşitli açılardan e, katkı sütüm. Uh, evet, hem kendini tanıt, sonra da katkı veya sorunu yönel. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, I'm Betül Haliloğlu. I'm a research assistant in uh, the Constitutional Law Department of Istanbul University. Uh, and I have had the opportunity to uh, write a chapter in this book concerning the Moreira Ferreira versus Portugal number two judgment. Um, I'd like to thank everyone uh, here, the editors, um, the authors, and our dean uh, for supporting uh, this project. And uh, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, for making this uh, project become a reality since it's been a long way uh, throughout. Um, well, in my chapter uh, in the book, I've evaluated, uh, the, as I said, the Moreira Ferreira judgment and in the separate opinion, and the judgment, uh, the main issue was, uh, I believe, the execution of judgments and, and the uh, role of the court uh, in this regard. And um, this issue still remains highly debated, uh, the execution of judgments and the court's uh, role uh, with respect to this. Um, and and due, to, due to my area of research concerning constitutional law, I've listened to your speech uh, concerning the impartial, impartiality of the uh, judiciary in this regard. Um, and uh, this issue is a highly debated issue in Turkey as well, uh, the uh, appointment of judges and the High Council of um, High Council of uh, Judges and Prosecutors and the impartiality of, uh, of the judiciary. Uh, however, um, well, uh, therefore, I think the judgment of the court and the protection that it provides, as you have stated, for the impartiality of the judiciary is, is very significant for, for the Turkish context. However, uh, as you have mentioned, the courts have uh, their limits, uh, especially as you've mentioned, for example, for the pre preliminary uh, ruling procedure for the uh, CJEU, uh, the limits of the European Court of Human Rights are also discussed. And I'd like to uh, ask you, uh, what is your take on this issue, especially uh, taking uh, article um, protocol 15, which has entered into force recently, which has uh, put uh, subsidiarity uh, as a uh, in the uh, convention. Um, so that, that's a new uh, topic, probably, uh, since we've discussed this issue with you, uh, I think, two years ago, but this protocol is a, is a new development. It entered into force in August. Uh, so that's my question, and, and I'd, I uh, have missed thanking you. Uh, thank you for your uh, judgments, uh, for, the, for your uh, separate opinions, and thank you for being here, making this book possible. Thank you. Should I reply immediately, Adam? Sure, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a difficult question, uh, but a um, very important one. Yes, the execution of judgments is crucial. You may have a beautiful sheet of paper. You may have a nice judgment, but if it is not executed, it's, it's nothing. It's really not worthwhile the, the fighting for it, uh, the fight for it. Um, so um, yes, it is important that uh, the judges are fully executed and in good faith by the national authorities. Uh, the problem is that sometimes there is lack of guidance. And I think you were referring to that. In the judgments, the judgments themselves are not clear enough. The judges in Strasbourg are not clear enough what they want from the national authorities. And this is problematic because then they are a bit uh, um, puzzled by the judgment and they cannot understand which way they should go. If the judgment is not clear, if the judgment does not state clearly what should 
be uh, the next step at the national level, then we have a problem. We have a problem in terms of the authority of the judgment. And we, yes, we have another problem, which is probably even worse, which is the disparity between member states. Because each member state will read the judgment its own way, probably according to its own legal framework. And then we create uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 different legal solutions or give leeway for creation of uh, as many solutions as, as member states. In itself, the disparity, the legal disparity, the element of richness uh, of having different legal solutions, it's, it's, it's positive. It's, it's a, an element of richness. The problem is, the, is, is equality. Law is also about the application of, uh, of this principle, of this basic principle of equality. And we are all European citizens. Um, the same principles, basic foundational principles should be applied all over Europe. Uh, so it is important that the court delivers clear judgments with a clear message that can be really uh, uh, perceived and interpreted uh, by, by, by the states, which then can implement and execute in good faith fully the, the, the judgments. And this is particularly important with regard to this issue that I brought today uh, to the debate. Um, independence of judges uh, must, of course, be the subject of very clear guidance by the European Court. Otherwise, the national authorities will be more or less lost and they will think, well, we can go this way or that way. It's, it's everything uh, uh, admissible. No, it is not. There are issues uh, of, of, of crucial, uh, absolute crucial uh, importance that do not allow for certain um, for certain solutions to be taken at the national level. So, and, but I, I think in this regard, in this regard, um, the European Court of Justice and uh, the, the, the European Court of Human Rights, they have, they have sent out a clear message. Um, what is missing sometimes, and particularly in Strasbourg, is uh, the indication of the consequences and Article 46, the consequences of the, of the finding of a violation. They, they go up to the stage of finding a violation, which is already very important because it's a statement of principle, but then they do not draw the consequences. And this is, of course, a pity because uh, the, it leaves some leeway for the states not to really fully implement the, the, the judgment. You have referred to the subsidiarity principle the fact that is now mentioned in the preamble, I don't think this uh, should influence um, the issue of, of the execution of judgment. I think um, uh, the subsidiarity principle uh, is not really linked uh, with, with the execution of judgments. Uh, the subsidiarity principle it's, uh, is linked with, with uh, the implementation of the rights and freedoms enshrined in the convention by the different parties and branches of, of the state. But when we have a decision, a judgment of the court, then it's binding. It's the final saying of the court. If we have rejudicata in Strasbourg, there's no more discretion for the state. There's no more uh, maneuvering. There's no more margin of, of discussion. It's a full final statement binding for the respondent state. We can eventually discuss whether it's also binding for the third parties, the other states which face similar problems. This is another discussion, okay? About the erga omnes effect of the judgments. This is another discussion, but inter partes, meaning between the applicant and the respondent state, 
When we reach the stage of a final saying of the court, be it a chamber judgment or a grand chamber judgment, when we reach that stage of rejudicata, no more discussion. No more discussion. No more maneuvering, no more uh, margins of appreciation whatsoever. No more, no, no. It's to be applied, full stop. It's to be applied. Why? Because the convention says so. Why? Because the states, when they entered, when they ratified the convention, they accepted the higher authority, uh, uh, um, the highest authority of, of, of the European court. The European court as the highest uh, instance, judicial instance in Europe. Um, so to sum up, I, I, think, I think we have a problem in terms of execution, especially uh, with regard to those judgments that are not clear in their message. We, this problem is compounded and aggravated when there is no indication, clear indication of the consequences of the judgment under Article 46. But this is a question that relates to, uh, to the inner uh, politics, I would say, inner balance of powers inside the court. Um, I, from my side, I always uh, pleaded for um, a statement, a clear statement of the consequences uh, of, of the judgment so that the respondent state knows what to do. In, in the Icelandic case, I wrote separately saying what they have to do is to reopen the case of the applicant. In all similar cases, my colleagues did not, they did not want to go that far. Because in my view, if there is such a, a grave violation, then we have to draw consequences. We cannot leave this uh, vague impression that um, everything is okay. Although we have a, a, a very serious violation, the, 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 the verdict, uh, the judgment, the domestic judgment can still stand. No, this, this is not really accepted. Another common question. Uh, I am Kemal Bashal. Uh, I am a research assistant in the field of constitutional law in uh, Turkish German University. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and for your for the honor uh, to be with you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, in regard with the former question and your answer. Um, in the future of uh, Court of Human Rights, um, are you assuming, are you hoping uh, or are you expecting that, are you expecting that uh, the Court of Human Rights will, uh, will lead, uh, will uh, playing the leading role in the uh, in field of human rights or uh, will it, do you think, uh, suppressed or uh, as you mentioned, uh, this inner balance uh, powers uh, or suppressed by the member states. Uh, I want to learn your opinion about yes. the future after you left the court. Thank you. Yes. Um, also another difficult question, very difficult question to anticipate the future. Um, well, wh what I can tell is that I hope that the European Court of Human Rights, I think we all share this, remains as the leading authority. It would be very bad sign if uh, it would not be the case. I hope that the, the European Court will remain the leading authority, uh, stating uh, what is what is the law in in Europe in terms of human rights. Um, I think that uh, what we have seen in the recent past uh, with regard to some constitutional courts and Supreme Courts fighting back against against Strasbourg, um, it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. Um, the authority of the court in Strasbourg is being undermined. Uh, it's unfair. We have an institution uh, of which we, sh we, all of us Europeans, should be proud. There are uh, five, six generations uh, of, of judges, of um, lawyers, 
of administrative staff working uh, in that marvelous institution, doing their best to protect our rights and freedoms, uh, consolidating uh, the case law uh, year after year, uh, and this for the benefit of us all. This for the benefit of all Europeans. So the, the European Court of Human Rights, it's a, an incredibly important institution that we should protect as citizens, as academics, we should protect. This does not mean that we do not criticize them when we think that they are wrong, of course. We should also criticize when we think they are going the wrong way, but uh, always with the due respect, the respect for the uh, incredible contribution of this institution for the development of human rights in, in Europe. So um, what I would say in response to your question is that I hope, this is my hope uh, and my belief also that the European Court will remain uh, the leading authority, will play a, a leading role and that the domestic courts, especially uh, constitutional and Supreme Courts that have disputed this role will uh, sense that um, um, they should eventually be more respectful towards Strasbourg and Strasbourg judges. Um, sometimes um, uh, judges um, feel that uh, the, the, the powers of the domestic courts have not been respected. This might be the case eventually, but I think uh, Strasbourg is always uh, tried with the best intention to help the national courts do a better job. This is the purpose of the entire system is the, the, the final purpose of the, the, this system is that the international uh, court helps, gives an helping hand to the national courts, to the national authorities so that they can provide better justice. Um, so this is my hope. This is my, my wish. Thank you. Uh, we have a last two question. Uh, Varanjan from Aslaikin. Another is online question from uh, Eren Sözer first. Thank you. Uh, my name is Asli Yilmaz. I'm a research assistant at the Turkish Jarmi University. I'm a PhD student here in Istanbul University. I don't actually have a question, but I just like to have a comment, if you may. Um, as a young academic, most of the time I'm hopeless on the issues with the, some rarity of changes in our field. And throughout this project, I happily realized that being dedicated, being stubborn and resilient actually could lead the way. So I just wanted to thank you in person to lead in the way. Thank you. Okay, thank if you. If I may reply in, in two words, I think young lawyers, young academics should be resilient, should strive for their, for their, for their, ideals for, for their uh, principles. Uh, I, I do not like when a young uh, lawyer or a young academic or even a young magistrate says, I'm, I'm hopeless. This is terrible. Uh, this is really terrible. The youth comes with hope, comes with the, 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 the force, the, the, the strength to fight for, for a better future for our societies. When Professor Suzur, my dear friend Adams, was talking about the Istanbul Convention, the importance of the Istanbul Convention, that crucial instrument for the future of women in Europe. I think that he was touching upon an issue that is of the utmost importance. It, it, this instrument showed uh, Europe and the world that uh, if you insist, you can at the end of the day come up with such a, a, a beautiful, a beautiful piece of legislation, of inter international legislation that can bring so much hope to women all over the world. It's not only in Europe. This is, this is a guiding 
uh, text for all women all over the world. It, it's, it's really a lighthouse in terms, a legal lighthouse in terms of what it provides to, to women uh, and, and to our societies. So if you really, if you are resilient, if you are uh, um, a person that, that does not give up easily, you can eventually come up with um, uh, texts of, of this, of this uh, importance and this magnitude. And you, and you should also, since they have been approved and they have been ratified, you, you, su you should protect them and sh you should uh, uh, make the, the most of it and, and try re really to keep, to keep them alive. Thank you. Uh, last question or comment from Aran Sujar. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Pinto, uh, for this very inspiring and intriguing speech, as always. Uh, my question is also related to impartiality uh, of judges. Uh, so um, uh, when reading your opinions, uh, one can't help but realize that you're very diligent in spotting the patterns of um, the decisions and uh, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, as well as the inconsistencies. And, and um, I, uh, and some of us are aware that you tend to point out some inconsistencies with regard with regard to uh, uh, the application of case law to uh, cases from different countries. So uh, I'm wondering of uh, what you think about the impartiality of the judges of the European Court of Human Rights, and perhaps uh, time permitting this could also be uh, extended to the impartiality of international judges in general, because uh, when uh, looking at some empirical work, um, uh, there isn't really evidence that uh, judges have systematic biases, but for instance, there is some evidence that uh, career insecurities make judges more likely to favor their national government governments, for instance. So I'm wondering if um, in your observations, do you think some judges might have implicit biases, uh, and this might be either due to cultural or geopolitical biases or to other reasons and um, uh, if, if if that is the case how would you propose that uh, these issues be reformed um, either through legal or other measures thank you well what a question <laughs> it's probably it's for sure the most difficult question it's it's about the impartiality of the european court of human rights itself and the judges of the European Court of Human Rights and, and, and more generally international judges. Dear Eren, uh, what a question, uh, very difficult question. What I would say from my experience, of course, is, is that um, uh, the Strasbourg Court is an independent court. The judges uh, at, at the Strasbourg Court um, are chosen uh, by a mechanism that really um, is uh, transparent, at least at, uh, at, the, at the international level. And if the domestic uh, mechanism is not transparent enough, of course, the national level um, is, is reproached. Uh, the national mechanism is reproached uh, uh, in, in Strasbourg. We have seen the problems uh, faced by certain national lists, uh, for instance, the, the Russian list, the Ukrainian list, um, uh, um, so um, I think I think that there are safeguards in the procedure uh, of of getting a, a a person to be selected to 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 Strasbourg that um, are um, I would say credible. These safeguards are credible. Now there are other courts where there are no such safeguards. I wrote an article um, uh, some years ago uh, precisely on that topic. If you want, I, I can send you the, the, the article. Um, it's exactly about the independence of, of international judges, where I was trying to assess um, uh, this uh, topic um, within the framework of different international organizations, including the Council of Europe, but other uh, uh, international organizations. And what I, what I really uh, found in terms of, of conclusion is that the situation is, is very much um, uh, um, different um, outside of, of Europe. 
so in Europe, we, we in terms of, of uh, the European Court of, of, uh, of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, um, the situation is it's pre pretty much, uh, um, uh, I would say, um, favorable to the, to the, to the independence of, of the international judges, which is not the case outside the, of Europe, where there are real problems, for instance, with the Inter-American Court and the Inter-American Commission, uh, namely due to lack of money. Where you do not have money, you have a problem of, of independence because, because uh, of course, uh, how, how can the judges work without, uh, without uh, staff, uh, without, uh, um, without uh, uh, proper, proper financial backing? So it's, 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 it's really serious. Um, um, so in my, view, in my view, there is a link. There is a serious link between impartiality and uh, institutional guarantees and safeguards uh, in international justice. Fortunately, in Europe, uh, the assessment that I have made of, of the European Court of Justice and the European um, uh, Court of Human Rights is, is very positive. It's very positive. So we can rely on the independence and impartiality of international judges. It's not fair, in my view, to criticize the judges uh, in Strasbourg um, uh, for lack uh, of independence. It's not fair. It's not fair. Uh, they do their utmost to really to, to, um, to, be, to be opaque to any kind of pressure from, from the governments. It is true that this, uh, this pressure is there sometimes, very visible, but the judges do their utmost really to protect themselves from, from this pressure. Um, and I think this is good for us because it, it gives us the reassurance that we are in good hands. We European citizens are in good hands when a case goes to Strasbourg or to Luxembourg, we have a guarantee that it will be assessed fairly in a fair way by independent judges. I cannot say the same outside of Europe. Uh, there, there are problems um, and, and, um, and this of course calls for, for reform of these uh, um, institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
Hakemlerimiz ve şeylerimiz aldı. Şimdi herkes buraya gelsin çok çabuk. Çok süre var. Hadi bir dakika şimdi herkes dursun bir dakika. Şimdi fotoğrafçı gidelim. Güzel. Güzel. Herkes orada dursun ben gelin gideceğim. Şey sen de alacaksın. Şimdi sen gel almaya. Bir dakika dur. Hocam Muhammed Bey de alacak. Artık şimdi anladım.